Welcome to Grassroot Ohio, conversations with everyday people working on important issues here in Columbus and all around Ohio. I'm Carolyn Harding, and today I'm talking with Michael Ketterer, PhD, an analytical chemist and professor emeritus of chemistry and biochemistry at Northern Arizona University. We'll talk about the Portsmouth, Ohio nuclear site otherwise known as the Portsmouth Gaseous Diffusion Plant, south of Piketon, Ohio, and hot in energy news this month. Michael Ketterer is an analytical chemist and professor of chemistry and biochemistry at Northern Arizona University. He holds a BS in chemistry from University of Notre Dame and a PhD in analytical chemistry from the University of Colorado. Michael has worked in private industry as a chemist for US EPA's Office of Enforcement and has taught at four different universities. Michael specializes in understanding the sources, transport, and environmental fates of long-lived radioactive contaminants, such as uranium and plutonium, near former and active nuclear sites. Michael has performed mass spectrometric studies of uranium isotopes in offsite samples near the Portsmouth nuclear site, which so show conclusively using modern nuclear forensics that the contamination originated from ports or Portsmouth nuclear site. The U and the US Department of Energy has contradicted but has not disproved Dr. Ketterer's results. Michael is currently providing technical assistance to communities throughout the US affected by legacy nuclear contamination. Welcome to Grassroot Ohio. Thank you very much, Carolyn. It's my pleasure to join you. Well, according to the US Department of Energy's website, the Portsmouth Gaseous Diffusion Plant operated from 1954 to 2001, located in Pike County, Ohio, which is south of Chillicothe and north of Ports Portsmouth. The plant occupies about 1,200 acres of the 3,777 acre federally owned Portsmouth site. The plant was one of three large gaseous diffusion plants in the United States, initially constructed to produce enriched uranium to support the nation's nuclear weapons program, and in later years, enriched uranium used by commercial nuclear reactors. After the Cold War, weapons-grade uranium enrichment was suspended and production facilities were leased to the private sector. And in 2001, enrichment operations were discontinued at the site. So, Michael, how did you get involved with the Portsmouth site? Well, uh, I, had, I had been studying for quite some time uh, similar contamination at a variety of sites across the U.S. And in the year 2018, I had just, uh, I'll call it retired. I was at the time teaching and was a professor of chemistry at Metropolitan State University of Denver. I left that. And uh, since I had 15 years in at NAU, I took the title Professor Emeritus and I started directing myself towards, well, what kind of scientific or public outreach activity do I want to do in the future? And uh, I had the occasion in September of 2018 to come to Ohio. And I was thinking in terms of, you know, I know Ohio quite well. My parents lived there for 40 years, and I lived myself in Ohio for five years. Uh, and uh, I didn't really know much about this place downstate called the uh, uh, Portsmouth Gaseous Diffusion Plant. So I started uh, reading about it. And uh, in September 2018, I had the occasion to make a trip to Ohio. So I did, and uh, I um, took a series of I'd say fairly unobtrusive, unnoticed type of samples from publicly accessible points near the facility, for example, from uh, water from Little, Little Beaver Creek is the name of a creek that drains this large uh, uh, nuclear reservation. Uh, sediments from that, soils from here or there. I took a series of samples and then I began analyzing them and it very quickly detected that there was something out of the normal with respect to 
the environmental contamination. There's clearly enriched uranium present in these environmental samples off the site. And there's also some other contaminants like Neptunium-237, which is uh, very specifically associated with this site. So after getting some preliminary results in fall of 2018, I started reaching out to people in the community and I came across uh, uh, a lady named Elizabeth uh, Lamerson, who had been um, writing Ohio EPA and asking them questions about the site. I got her email address and I contacted her and I said, I propose that we work together. And uh, Elizabeth started sending samples to me from things that she had collected. She lives, uh, oh, maybe a mile and a half east of the site in, uh, in a rural area. It's uh, uh, kind of south and east of where Piketon is and just to the east of the site. So uh, Elizabeth uh, started sending me a series of samples and uh, uh, this culminated in 2019, in April 2019, I released a public report. Okay, and where did you release the report? Well, uh, I made the report available to the public through uh, Elizabeth, uh, who distributed printed copies and it was provided to uh, local officials. For example, uh, Matt Brewster is the, uh, uh, the, the health director of Pike County and Matt, we provided a report to. And on the date that the report was made public, uh, the Pike County General Health District had planned a meeting of the citizens to talk about uh, this very issue of the offsite contamination. They wanted to talk about uh, what DOE had recently revealed. The Department of Energy had just revealed uh, that they had detected Neptunium-237 uh, in the air, in their air monitoring network, at a location called Zahn's Corner, where there is a now closed, uh, uh, I believe it's a middle school. And uh, the community was in an uproar at that time over the two things, one that the Neptunium was detected and second that the Department of Energy had waited on the order of a year and a half to uh, disclose these results to the public. And uh, uh, I was informed about this upcoming meeting. And of course I knew about the uh, Zahn's Corner air monitoring results. And uh, Elizabeth and I had also analyzed samples directly from the attic at the Zahn's Corner school. And I had my own information about what's specifically inside the school. And we did indeed find enriched uranium in these dusts. Uh, and so, um, on that date at this meeting, uh, I guess this was in the pre-Zoom era, I made a presentation by telephone with uh, Matt and Elizabeth advancing my PowerPoint slides to the community and I disclosed, here's my findings. And it, it was completely contradictory to the Department of Energy's narrative at the time. Yeah, I, in the um, Department of Energy's website, you're mentioned and they, you know, basically said it was you know not good science or that they've proven that 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 there's no problem that there's no serious problem of contamination so what did they how did they test and how did you test well uh uh the methods that i'm using are all based on uh sound science they would pass the daubert uh test in uh, a US court of law for evidentiary standards. I have background in forensic chemistry. I spent six years uh, at US EPA in the Office of Enforcement, and that was my job to produce uh, laboratory and field evidence to prove contamination, to show that parties were responsible or had violated environmental statutes. I was used to doing all that, having depositions, testifying in court, having my records looked at that. And um, uh, further, you know, in my testing methodologies, I am using things that I learned from reading papers authored by the Department of Energy. And uh, uh, I'm using science that's well established in the same type of instrumentation the same types of analytical procedures that I'm using are used at the Department of Energy's own labs. Um, 
what was a little bit different about our methodologies for sampling at Zahn's Corner is uh, Elizabeth Lamerson uh, and I uh, made use of baby wipes, just common, uh, you know, wet cloths, uh, disposable wet cloths. Uh, they have very, in, very low intrinsic uranium concentration. They're very good for uh, wiping dust, you know, on smooth surfaces. And then these can be, you know, put in a Ziploc bag, sent to the laboratory. Uh, I incinerate them in a laboratory furnace and then uh, uh, dissolve the ash, measure how much uranium and measure its isotopic composition. What Department of Energy was fixated on is they have some protocol where they use uh, a specific type of glass fiber uh, wiping substrate. It's a round piece of, excuse me, filter paper, about 47 millimeters, about two inches in diameter, and they will wipe a defined 100 square centimeter area. Their uh, methodologies are all based on health physics and conducting radiological risk assessments. So they're kind of looking at something completely different than I am. My focus is on, can we detect any enriched uranium? Can we, can we detect influence from this plant in the offsite environment? How far does that influence go? Uh, you know, those are the kinds of questions that I'm trying to address. The Department of Energy is, is going at something completely different, which is, you know, is in, in simple terms, you know, is this risky enough from the radiological standpoint that the radiation itself is posing, you know, a short term risk to individuals near this stuff? And, and uh, I, I mean, it's, it's a completely different purpose. And I, I don't think it's really that relevant to uh, the public health. I mean, these are contaminants that are being, people are being exposed to over decades, very, very, um, a uh, slow process over a long period of time. And what the Department of Energy is looking at is more like uh, a scenario for sampling for re acute radiological hazards, you know, like a, a spill of some highly radioactive uh, uh, material it, that's uncontained and they wanna see, you know, does that present a risk to the public? Um, uh, the Department of Energy, I'll just say this, you know, with respect to them, saying I'm a fringe scientist or something like that. Uh, the, the Department of Energy really ought to go to uh, Google Scholar and look up my background and they can see that, you know, I've, I've published a lot of papers in this area of measuring uranium or plutonium, a lot of work with plutonium, measuring its isotope composition, measuring how much of it is and using that to make some type of uh, environmental interpretation. I've been doing that for a long, long time. And uh, uh, if they think that somehow, you know, my results that I've made public are not reliable, they, they're barking up the wrong tree completely. Well, I also know that the Department of Energy has, you know, they have objectives of what they want to do with this, this facility. Um, and also, I'm curious what the health impacts would be on these students had they not closed down this middle school. And um, you said it was plutonium? Um, the contaminant is called neptunium. It's another element. It's, it's up there in the periodic chart. It's a neighbor of both uranium and plutonium and it's, it's radioactive. Um, and that was the contaminant that uh, DOE had found uh, at the Zons Corner School they admitted to from their own air monitoring data. Um, you know, with respect to the Department of Energy, uh, you know, questioning my credibility, I'll, I'll take it right back at them and I'll say, I question their credibility because the Department of Energy flat out made knowingly false statements to the community in 2019. I'm not just talking statements like, oh, I went fishing and I caught a 45 inch pike and, uh, you know, then it jumped into the boat and bit, bit, me, bit me on the leg. You know, I'm not talking those kinds of false statements. I'm talking 18 USC 1001 false statements. The Department of Energy tried to tell the community on April 27th, 2019, that the neptunium that had been detected from um, 
uh, this Zahn's corner monitor, that Neptunium was not from the DOE site at all. It was from nuclear weapons testing in the 1950s and 60s, which is true that the Neptunium, that Neptunium does originate from that and can be found you know, in the Earth's surface environment, but uh, the uh, quantities and the signature of the Neptunium with reference to other substances like plutonium, uh, the fingerprint of this Neptunium was very, very clearly uh, from Portsmouth. So the Department of Energy knew this was the case. You know, they had their local people, Jeremy Davis, uh, Greg Simonton, and a, and a uh, contractor working for Fleur BWXT, uh, J.D. Dowell, all these people, you know, created this narrative that Neptunium was from the global fallout. And uh, Robert, I'll me also mention Robert Edwards of uh, the Portsmouth Paducah Project Office, uh, as well as another number of people from DOE EM going up to uh, Anne Marie White, who was fired, and uh, uh, Under Secretary uh, Paul DeBar, his name was. This was in 2019. Uh, a lot of people were involved in creating this narrative. Um, and uh, at this meeting of April 27th, 2019, when these guys all offered this narrative on video and uh, made these false statements, I was in the other corner saying, no, this is where the Neptunium comes from. And interestingly, I was relying on uh, two key papers uh, published by the DOE themselves. One of them was from Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory. They're a DOE contractor. They make their living off of DOE. And the other one was from Pacific Northwest Laboratories near the Hanford site. They also make their living uh, providing technical work to the Department of Energy. So I'm relying on DOE's own science to, uh, to say what is the truth and uh, and contradict these uh, these false statements. This is Carolyn Harding with Grassroot Ohio, and today I'm talking with Dr. Michael Kedrer. He um, is a professor emeritus in. Um, why don't you tell us again exactly what your specialty is? Well, I'm an analytical chemist, which means I measure things. I'm interested in radioisotopes uh, and as contaminants in the environment in, with particular emphasis on the elements uranium and plutonium. And I study them in the environment near former and uh, still in use uh, uh, US nuclear sites and uh, throughout the US. So um, Michael, the uh, DOE says they are decontaminating and decommissioning the Portsmouth site for future uses. Talk about what they say might work and talk about what you think through your research and experience with these kind of sites, what this site could be used safely for in the future. Well, there's no question about it that a lot of contaminants have been released into the environment just in the process of uh, attempting to dismantle uh, the site. And uh, during the time period approximately 2011 to 2021, uh, the DOE was conducting what they called D&D, &D, and I think that's deactivation and decommissioning. Mm -hmm. And uh, during that time, they were removing all of the gaseous diffusion process equipment, removing all the plumbing, and trying to expel all of the uh, condensed solidified uh, uranium bearing materials from the inside of this gaseous diffusion plant. They had done what's called a cold shutdown, which means that all of the vapors of uranium hexafluoride and all that stuff, instead of being warmed to stay in the gas form, it condenses and all the solids form. So the Department of Energy went to great lengths to decontaminate that. They used a process called LTLT, long temperature, low temperature, long time uh, treatment with uh, certain aggressive chemicals that would convert all of that stuff back into uh, fluorides and they'd heat them up and expel them. Um, there's a report that uh, was done in 2018 that characterized the trapped materials re re recovered from this cascade process. It was sent to Nevada. It was uh, not considered 
uh, amenable to disposal locally in the on-site waste disposal facility, but it was sent to Nevada. And you can look at that report and there's a table of the isotopes that are present there. And it's, you know, there's your Neptunium-237 uh, showing up right there. There's the fingerprint. And this would have been the material that would have been released into the atmosphere, would have been detected at Zahn's Corner Middle School. There was quite a lot of this from DOE's own air monitoring data, which one can access. There's a website called Pegasus, P-E-G-A-S-I-S, -S, that has DOE's uploaded uh, data. I went and looked at some of those uh, data and uh, uh, found that, you know, in the period, I think it was about 2013 to 2016, there were huge emissions from that plant that, just to give you an example, um, the levels of technetium-99, which is another radioisotope uh, associated with the Portsmouth plant, uh, levels of tech-99 were as high 14 miles southwest of the plant, they're virtually as high as they were at the monitors located right by the fence line. So there was a huge plume during those years as a result of this trying to remove this and disassemble and decontaminate the thing. Uh, there was a huge uh, uh, impact of contamination uh, back in those years. And then, um, you know, they, in 2021, they started the open air demolition of the uh, highly enriched uranium process building called the X326 building. And many community members implored the DOE not to do things that way. And uh, uh, the DOE uh, insisted that their models all said, you know, all of this is fine. We're going to proceed with doing things this way. And uh, uh, of course, as you may imagine, uh, what happens next, you know, the contaminated dust is just transported off site. Hmm. So with the work that they've done and your knowledge of contamination, do you feel like this area never will be safe for people to work in or live nearby or go to school next to, or is there a way that it can be remediated to a place that if you have the right gear, it's safe? Well, I, I, I should start, I should preface my answer by saying that, you know, I'm not a toxicologist or a health effects person, so I can't really directly uh, address your question about, you know, is it safe? Uh, I will say that the whole area uh, with some pretty wide pattern, at least 10 miles or so surrounding the facility, uh, the whole area is, is contaminated to a degree. And, uh, you know, it, in, in terms of that contamination can be detected and it can be forensically associated with the former gaseous diffusion plant because it, there's enriched uranium there and that's where it had to have come from. It doesn't occur like that in nature. Um, does this hurt anybody? Well, I, I, it's, it's, it, that's not really within the, uh, the, the realm of my expertise, but I'll say this, you know, it's, if you're finding it in the environment, uh, say in the soil or dust, you know, a few miles from the plant that says that it had to be in the air. So that is saying that humans were exposed to it. So people were exposed to it. And uh, the flip side of this is I want to draw everybody's attention to uh, a new study that's out by an epidemiologist, Joe Mangano, uh, who did this work for Ohio Nuclear Free Network. And uh, Joe's report using epidemiological analysis shows that the deaths and the cancer deaths in Pike County are extremely high on both on Ohio as well as a national comparison basis. So um, epidemiology isn't proving the cause, and I'm not proving the cause either, but I'm saying the contamination is there, and the epidemiology is saying the health effects appear to be there too, the negative health effects. So uh, what we're missing is, you know, really a direct tie of, uh, of the contamination to these ill health effects. But uh, on a precautionary basis, it, it has to be alarming to uh, see both this 
this clear and obvious contamination pattern and um, the resulting health statistics, which are, you know, pretty distressing. Well, talking about um, your colleague, um, the Ohio Nuclear Free Network is presenting a forum um, on radioactive contamination, environment and public health and the future of the Portsmouth nuclear site on Saturday, June 10 at 1 p.m. And it's a, right there at the Comfort Inn in, on US 23 in Piketon, Ohio. And you are headlining. You are one of the main speakers and you're gonna be talking about contamination is forever, radioisotopes near the Portsmouth gaseous plant. Then your colleague, Joseph Mangano, will also present his paper, Soaring Death Rate Near Ohio Uranium Plant. And then the attorney, esteemed um, environmental attorney, Terry Lodge, will, he's a specialist in environmental law and civil rights. And his, he'll be talking about, is Piketon's disastrous past a prelude to even worse? So and you do not need to register for this, but you can um, go online and um, listen to it if you cannot make it in person. And I will make sure on Grassroot Ohio's Facebook page that you will be able to get this live stream uh, link. And um, I just wanted to tell you in the news just recently, there's news that there's going to be a hydrogen plant possibly in this facility and maybe even nuclear plants coming, um, coming soon. Are you familiar with these, this news? Well, um, with respect to the, uh, the Portsmouth Nuclear Reservation, if we call it that, I'm mostly, I have mostly been concentrating on uh, analyzing the legacy previous contamination from the gaseous diffusion plant. So trying to unravel what happened between 1950 something and the present. And uh, I haven't focused as much on what the plan is for the future, but I know that one of the things they wanna do is um, uh, there's many thousands of depleted uranium hexafluoride containing cylinders. They look like uh, you know large propane tanks that you'd see in a rural area for somebody to heat their house with. But these are filled with depleted uranium hexafluoride, which is essentially the garbage. It's the leftover unwanted material at the end of the enrichment process. Well, um, I, it's my understanding that the government has a plan to take this and purify this depleted uranium uh, hexafluoride and make it into new high purity depleted uranium metal. So there's that there's there's a number of activities, including that and centrifuging uh, new uranium and downblending and uh, uh, there's there's a number of activities and I, I imagine it could include uh, producing hydrogen and building uh, small modular reactors at the site. Uh, the the it, it appears that the federal government has great plans for this site in the future and they cast it in vague terms like redevelopment or you know re clean energy reindustrialization yes sure. there's, there's 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 a considerable greenwashing of of nuclear energy and i think if you look at the legacy of portsmouth i think nuclear energy you know all energy producing technologies uh have negative environmental effects associated with them. But uh, this is one of the filthiest places imaginable in America with respect to uh, legacy contamination. And, uh, you know, all of this has to be factored in and deciding whether nuclear is green or not. I mean, if, if nuclear was carbon free, um, uh, why do they have such big hydro, why do they have such big high tension lines that were running between coal fired power plants and the Portsmouth plant to power the gaseous diffusion process? You know, there's plenty of carbon inputs into uh, making nuclear power uh, work. So I, I, I don't really all know what the plans are. I defer that to uh, Terry Lodge's talk, but uh, I do plan on uh, saying quite a lot about uh, the legacy contamination, the ongoing contamination during the um, during the the uh, the
demolition and so on. And I hope everybody is uh, that's interested has a chance to attend. Thank you so much, Dr. Michael Ketterer. And I look forward to listening to your um, presentation. Um, what day is that again, June 10? Saturday, June 10th at the Comfort Inn in Piketon, Ohio. Thank you so much. Thank you, Carolyn. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. As of June 1st, WGRN's new radio tower is up and running and our new ID is 91.9 FM. And if you are outside of Columbus Metro, you can always stream us on Fridays at 5 p.m. Eastern Standard Time at www.wgrn.org. Our Sunday 2 p.m. show can be streamed at www.wcrsfm.org. And that radio tower will be up and running at 92.7, 98.3 FM on June 10. You can also find us on SoundCloud. Apple Podcasts, Spotify, YouTube, Facebook, and Instagram. Thanks for joining us.